Yo, thank you for checking out my channel. Um, really appreciate it, guys. Just want to go over with you really quick. Um, a major piece of history, and that's the Arab conquest of the 7th and 9th century. And I know that can sound like a boring subject on the surface, but this is an event that has a huge impact on uh, Middle Eastern politics and global politics. And I went through the American education system, and I know we spent a lot of time talking about Napoleon, uh, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great. We go over all their conquests and their battles and the armor they used. We talk about the rivalry between um, Athens and Sparta. And ultimately, I think as you get further and further into the details, these things kind of lose their significance. Um, what is really the significance of the rivalry between two city-states in ancient Greece? I think when you look at the Arab conquest, that I, I think the American education system kind of overlooks, this actually has an impact on how we view the world. And isn't that the point of teaching history to actually have people be informed on on things that happen today or it, or is it just a way for western historians to kind of toot their own horn and show how grand and great they were because then then it it, it perverts history in a way and, and and why we should teach it and i also think there's some people that talk about the arab conquests and let me just briefly explain like it, it's not some super complicated idea it's just Arabs who originated from Medina and Mecca and what is today known as Saudi Arabia. And th they came about right after um, the religion of Islam had started. And they came and they conquered all this territory, as you can see here in green. And what's important about this is they didn't just conquer the territory, but they left their culture and religion and they spread scientific ideas and math and and it greatly impacted these areas and I'm going to show you it even has an effect on how um, our politics is viewed today so and, and, and I think a lot of people what I was about to get into was that uh, uh, there are people who talk about the Arab conquest, but they talk about it in a way to show Islam and it's violent and it's militant and it's it's trying to uh, create a caliphate and it's violent and they're savages and they're greedy. And I think that's just a historical. Uh, um, I am going to play you a clip in just one second of Yale professor Paul Friedman, but I just want to lay out that it, A, that it, it's a historical to say that, and B, there's so much more significance to it than, than just writing it off as greedy savages. And, and, and I can tell you, isn't Alexander the Great a greedy savage? Isn't Napoleon a greedy savage? Isn't George Bush a greedy savage? So anyone who conquers a lot of territory can always be written off. It's about acquiring. It's about taking. So yeah, but that's no reason not to study it or to just hand wave it, you know? But so that being said, I do want to get into this clip from Yale professor Paul Friedman because this is really interesting and I think you'll like it. The Islamic conquests, which certainly take place partly because of religious motivation, but nevertheless are not, not accompanied by some fanatical desire to convert the world. The Muslim conquests have to be understood in terms of religious motivation, but not in terms of a determination to wipe out Judaism in Christianity. What appears to be a paradox uh, uh, makes this era a little hard to understand. Namely, the paradox being that you would have such a rapid expansion of the Arabs and the religion that they carried, uh, which eventually would uh, extend from Spain to India. And at the same time, 
that uh, Islamic, the Islamic population would be a minority in most of those conquered regions for centuries, that there is not a demand for the conversion of uh, the population to Islam, and that although the conversion does take place in many, even most parts of this imperial caliphate, it doesn't take place immediately and it doesn't take place under great pressure. All right, so you can see from that video that, yes, the Arabs conquered all this territory, and yes, besides for Spain, pretty much all this area in green, obviously, um, w when you get to this part near Turkey in Europe, it becomes more complicated. But most of this area you see in green is Muslim today. And it's not because they were forced to convert, but they eventually did for various reasons um, that will not be explained in this video. But I think the first place to start is, is Persia. So keep in mind that Persia was like a civilization that existed for hundreds of years. I mean, they, they weren't pushovers. So on one hand, this does show that the Arabs did have some kind of advantage um, o over these civilizations, and it was basically their mobility. But Persia does eventually convert to Islam, a lot of the people there. Now, they're ethnically Persian, which is different from Arabs who came from the Saudi region who are Arabs. So one thing that's important to learn is that there became a lot of tension between the Persian Muslims of Persia and the Arab Muslims of Arabia, as you could probably imagine. And what this leads to that's so important to our history today is that Persia and the Persians sort of created their own version of Islam that's not so Arab centric. And this is Shia. If you ever hear the Sunnis, Sunni Islam comes from the Saudi re region and Shia Islam comes from the Persian region, which is now Iran and big parts of Iraq. And it's important to know that Iran today is the only Shia majority country in the world. So if you look globally, most people in the most uh, Muslim people in the globe, I should say, are either Sunni Islam or non-denominational. Most of the world is not Shia Islam, but in Iran, the majority of the people are Shia. And even in Iraq, it has large portions of Shia. And even parts of Lebanon have huge pockets of people who are Shia. But those countries aren't majority. They still have a majority of Sunni in those countries. And that sets the stage for today, the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran because it there's just this little Persian Gulf that separates the two. The two countries have large amounts of oil and they compete on the global market and their religions are different. And that's what leads into a lot of the proxy wars that we see today. And a quick examination of the Arab conquests can kind of easily show you this history. And even in Iraq, Saddam Hussein was part of a Ba'athist party that is Shia, but he himself was a Sunni. And he was seen to have oppressed the Shia populations in Iraq, which also leads to a lot of turmoil. So we can see, as you hear, a lot of the turmoil in, in the Middle East today can be traced back to the Arab conquests. And a, a, another place on the planet that this really impacted to was India. They brought Islam to India. And if you know, in 1947, um, tensions between 
Muslims and non-Muslims or, or mostly Hindus in India, the tensions became so great that there was actually a partition in 1947 that separated India, and that's how Pakistan became a country. And if you know about a region that's part of India, but right between Pakistan and India, there's a region known as the Kashmir region, which it's part of India, but still the majority of the people who live there are Muslim. And there's huge tensions on the border between Pakistan and India that happen today that can all be traced back to these Arab conquests. Even another thing, too, like the Arab conquests make their way north. And another important thing about the Arab conquests is they spread the religion beyond these green borders or, or yeah, these green borders that you see here. Um, if you look today, Indonesia is actually the country with the largest Muslim population in the world. Um, most Muslims in the world are non-Arab. If you look, this is how you get in eastern China, a Uyghur population that people say is discriminated against by the CCP. So... You know, all of that can be traced back to the Arab conquests. Um, um, and yeah, even people in the Baltic regions. You know, it, it, Islam did make its way to Western Europe as well. Um, but, but one thing, it, 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 it even highlights Spanish history. Because if you see all these countries did end up becoming Islam, well, what happened here in Spain? And in Spain, you know, when you really start to study their history, they have a Spanish Inquisition. They seems to be a country that has a lot of religious intolerance. And I think it's the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, Spain pretty much outlaws Islam. So th that's the only reason that it doesn't really exist there today. But it did. It did after these conquests, and it does shed a light on Spanish history as well. Um, you can see this North African region. This is where Libya, which NATO has invaded, I think, in 2012. Um, Algeria, Egypt, these northern African countries are also have huge predominant Muslim populations. As you go further south in Africa, the Muslim population... Um, goes down but you know th this has an impact on our history too in many different ways like one of them could be that you know you see Malcolm X you see Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who I think is one of the greatest basketball players of all time they converted to Islam as a way to sort of reach their African roots or, or what they felt was reaching their African roots and that and that for all they knew, their ancestors were Muslim. They weren't sure because they felt they had their history taken away from them. What they're referring to is these Arab conquests and the possibility that maybe their ancestors were Muslim. And that is literally why they changed their name. So you can see that it even has significance beyond just the area that it conquered. So... I think this is all um, really important. And, and, and one final word on this is that I think when I really started studying foreign policy, the one thing I, that, that really stood out to me was that the Middle East is put into this giant, this giant box where everyone is just an Arab Muslim riding around on camels living in mud houses, they all, you know, th th they're backwards, th their religion teaches them violence. And I think when I started really studying the Middle East, you see how complex it is of different cultures and um, d different ways of, they have different politics and different governments. And the sooner you put them all into a box, it's easier to invade Libya, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, 
in some ways I ran because y- you can st- sort of attribute the crimes and ideas of one to all of them and they all sort of get put in this box of of there's Hezbollah, there's Saddam Hussein, there's Osama bin Laden and it, the, the sooner you put all this area into just one box that's how you get to invade each country individually the, the the second you start separating the politics and the people and and the ethnicities and the beliefs and why things are the way they are i i i think that's the knowledge you need to understand that that It's not so easy to just start dropping bombs on all these different countries. And we actually need a foreign policy that's intelligent and and somewhat in root with the history and these people. And, And don't we have a responsibility as citizens if our government is going to meddle in the politics of all these countries that at least we get some kind of understanding of their history? And I think just this quick map and just a quick gloss over, and there's more things you can add, but it's just important to know that this event happened in history and this is why things are the way they are. But anyway, I'm going to have a lot more videos coming out. So I, I know I took a little bit of a break there. really appreciate everybody and have a good rest of your day.